Hello, and I'm really excited to be here, and sorry my French is so poor. Uh, I learned some in school, but that's so long ago, my French is so poor, so I will stay with English. Uh, I'm going to talk about interacting with intelligent systems. And I will start with a question, and it's, it's a real question, and I think it's taking uh, what we've just heard to the more fundamental level to start with, to the really basic question. Who decides what you know and believe? This is very fundamental, and I think it has been probably sort of, yeah, more relevant nowadays than many times before. And I think it's, it's, it's also not a simple question. So, and I, uh, I'm not sure, it's, it's probably a bit uncommon, but this is really an open question. Uh, please shout out, what do you think is fundamental to what, to who decides what you believe? What is fundamental to what we believe? Your parents? Your parents? The upbringing? The social environment? The social environment? <coughs> Don't be shy, just, because I think this is really something we have to figure out. Social media? Movie. Movies? Science. Science. So all of you went to school. Who had, has decided what you learn in school? The French government. The French government, yes. And I think, I've, uh, and I think many in academia have been in one or the other session where there are fights for restructuring the curriculum. And this is real fights. This is like sort of, because if you teach people something in school, and be it about climate, be it about gender, if you start teaching in school, it becomes common knowledge. And this is sort of the old system. We can still argue that was very democratic. We basically had a way. Now, how do kids learn about things nowadays? They still go to school, obviously. But there is a lot they will learn on Khan Academy, on social media, on YouTube. And that's basically creating your norm. That's what you believe. And I think it's really, really fundamental that this is not sort of like in the old days. That has changed over the last 10 years. And I argue this will massively change over the next 10 years. And the interface is in the middle. Now, basically, the next question that goes along with it, who creates your reality? How much personal interaction have you have that informed you about the war in Ukraine? And how much of what you know do you know because of media? I've only met a handful of people who came from Ukraine to Munich, but I've seen a lot on newspapers, etc. And I think this is, goes with politics, this goes with a lot of things. Again, we are at this point that your reality is created by algorithms, by media. And again, it's just starting, but I show later that we are really at this point where we have to decide who makes the decision. And I saw earlier somebody reading a newspaper, and I think this is really an interesting thing. If you have a newspaper, you have a limited number of pages. And if I buy a newspaper, I get the same newspaper as you. That's changing at the moment. And again, this is algorithmic what is happening, this selection. And I think this puts it into the very, very fundamental question, who controls you? What happened to free will? And that's very philosophical. But we'll see later, it's really down to earth. It's very simple things like sending people a message on the phone will stop them while they walk. Very, very simple. So you have this free will, you want to walk through the park, you get a message, you stop. I think I make this joke usually in Munich when basically, how do you move people from one place to another? You send them a message about free beer, and that will move the crowd. So <laughs> obviously, this is sort of uh, taking it to, to sort of the funny side of it. But I think this is sort of the bigger picture uh, that we don't get lost in sort of looking at algorithms. This is the bigger picture. This is not sort of optional. This is sort of 
designing reality. It is not like doing one interfacing, doing another uh, text menu. That's what we very often, sort of when we are down to our daily business, we are trying to optimize a system, get a next system. But what we are doing on a higher level, on a more fundamental level, it's we are designing reality for people and we are deciding by how we build the systems who has control over that reality. Now let me embed this a little bit in uh, our work on amplifying human abilities because that's at the core of it. If we would be happy with what we could do at the moment, we would probably not build new systems. But humans have always improved their abilities to do things building machinery, uh, building things. And the last 1,000 years were really about physical machinery. If you look at buildings that were built in the last few hundred years, you could not imagine this 1,000, 2,000 years ago, except the pyramids, I think. But they had also technology to help them. So really, this idea of building technology that makes us stronger, uh, that moves us faster, that was basically the last few hundred years. Now we are at that point that we build machinery that makes us more intelligent. And I think the question is, does it make us more intelligent or does it make us appear more intelligent or does it empower us to act more intelligent? And there are a number of uh, points I will look into. It's externalization of memory, cognitive and perceptual enhancements, uh, creating reality and intimate control. So these are two pictures out of uh, work we've done. And I think one question that's really interesting is about the bandwidth. So how fast can you read? This is something which impacts your ability to study. If you are a fast, good reader, you have a higher chance of performing well in school and in university. Because you just have the ability to take more in. So basically this bandwidth Getting information from the outside into your brain. This is something where a lot of research in our lab goes into. So if you look back, sort of the reading that has been around for a long time, and one of the things we looked here into is we put people an uh, EEG on the head, like measuring their cognitive load, and basically optimized the reading speed, and it was basically not linear reading like this. It was basically just flashing words with the right frequency that you're fully engaged. And what you get, basically you get, typically most of you here will read about 200 words per minute. So if it's sort of complex text, some of you may probably be up to 300, 250, but it's getting hard. And I think basically if you optimize this, you can optimize for easy and hard tasks. So some text is being read faster. And I think this is something once you improve this only by 10%, most tasks involve reading. If you are reading 10% faster, you are basically 10% more efficient. Similarly here from another experiment, this is about externalizing memory. So basically this is one week of a person's memory. Uh, every 30 seconds to a minute a picture is taken and they're not stacked, they're just shown out. And you get, basically you walk into that dome and you get within basically one minute, you get a memory of what you did last week. It, it's, it's very, very powerful. Again, sort of on an experimental level, this is really fun and, and I enjoy that research. But on a more fundamental level, that really puts us in a tricky situation. It's basically looking at a memory side, who should reinforce your memory and who should attenuate your memory? So who should have the right to really make you remember things, revise things? And I show you something very simple. You have seen this oops, uh, probably a hundred times. This is just a screenshot of my image folder. And in each of those folders, there are probably hundreds of pictures or at least tens of pictures. And somebody chooses for me this picture. Each time I open that picture folder, when I look for something in there, I will get these pictures. And obviously what is going to happen, these pictures which I see here, they will be enhanced in my memory. And we know the price for enhancing those memories is basically we lose memories. We, we will less remember other pictures. So basically, by choosing pictures here, and at the moment I really believe uh, 
Microsoft, uh, Apple, they do it really random or pick the first one. There is no. But obviously, once uh, you can optimize, so I could put things in here which make you buy things or want you to go back to certain places, etc. Again, this is sort of very simple. So this idea, I extend my memory into the system, and then it's not like complex, I have to get into your brain. It's really just how I order things. And I have the other example, which you know, which people should show up here. There are 37 people on my phone. And basically, uh, the, this is sort of, when, whenever I open my, uh, this is in German, sorry. Whenever I open my uh, pictures, I get a few pictures shown, and they are obviously sort of amplified in my mind. Should Apple have this, or should I do that? Because it is really creating my reality. It is very likely when I open this, I may call one of those people. Things like this. So I think, again, sort of very simple things, and this risk of memory augmentation really is uh, once we have these systems, it's inevitable that somebody meddles with our, with our memory. And the question here is basically, who do we trust our images to? Is it good to put them onto an online store where basically somebody makes sure they get nicely sorted, they get nicely shown? Also, the way I get basically stack them, which pictures do I put together and where I hide the others underneath, which do I put next to it? And so this is a question, I think, uh, here, just as an example for memory, we have this in a lot of areas. Who do we trust with this? Now, another one is about enhancing cognitive and perceptual functions. This has been, again, something we have seen a lot what people try to do. So if you look at big scientific discoveries, the microscope or uh, binoculars, they were really key to seeing new things, literally seeing new things. And this is something, when we look into the perceptual world, that's an area where we have been building prototypes, making you see things you couldn't see before. I'll go into details here. We also look into cognitive enhancements, and this is basically where we worked with a sheltered work organization where people with disabilities work, and we looked into can we externalize cognitive functions? And what we could show, basically they were building uh, complex Lego structures that was together with a big car manufacturer, so we are allowed to show the Legos. Uh, they also build other stuff, uh, which we're not allowed to show. And the interesting thing is we got people with uh, severe disabilities to the same performance as regular workers for building the Lego structures. And again, this is sort of was not very welcome by the regular workers. They said, ah, that doesn't really help. But it was very welcome by people with disabilities because it obviously, and it, that's basically cognitive. And in the end, it's basically transforming a complex plan into just lights that pop up. And I think the people who, are, who have full cognitive function, they say, oh, that feels really I'm like a robot. I don't like that. The people with, prob uh, with problems transferring this knowledge into it uh, into sort of action, they really liked it. So that's an interesting one. So we can perhaps level the field. I talk now a little bit more about sort of uh, the cognitive enhancements in a moment, but I put one slide in because uh, Wendy earlier showed uh, the Turing uh, test. And I think we have been playing around with this question, what is sort of the new version of the Turing test? And I think this is a bit like the abstracted old version. You have a question, it's a human or a machine, and you get an answer. Can you tell where the answer comes from, from the machine? That's sort of simplified the Turing test. Is this answered by a human? Is it answered by a machine? But what we find nowadays more interesting is this question. So imagine you have a human without any technical enhancement, and you have a human with technical enhancement. Let's assume you have one person who is just a person and the other person has an iPad with internet connectivity. Which question can you put that that person has no chance? Give me a concrete question that that person has no chance. What's the solution of, of Kenya, for example? So a very factual question. Now comes the interesting question. 
Can you give me a question where this person will be sort of not as good as the other one? Give me a high level overview of the talk you just heard. I think. It's a trick question. Why is it a trick question? The person with augmentation is so far always also a person without augmentation. But we have to learn when to not use the technology. And I think this is sort of, that's why it's, it's, it's a trick question in a way. But I think usually, even so, it's a trick. It's really hard to find things. I think finding concrete things, what people without augmentation. But I think, and then there comes this additional level. If we know when to use technology and when not to use technology, uh, that makes us really powerful. So this is an interesting one. And uh, so I think this is more for, I think, sort of a discussion over a glass of wine in the bar. So I think... But there is uh, an example which I think Wendy and I also talked some time about it, and uh, she had earlier the Kasparov example. So there is a new way of playing chess. It's called Centaur chess or hybrid chess, where basically a team of people plays against another team of people, and each team has computers. And so you get basically the idea, when do I trust the computer? When do I basically make decisions that are sort of just based on my knowledge. And I think this is something, I like this as an image, how we want to build, build systems. But now let's step back to uh, amplification of human perception. And that's basically in the context uh, of a bigger European project. And it's the idea, can we enhance human perception, especially human vision? And the system we build at the moment is basically, it doesn't look as nice as the drawing. It's still really pretty bulky. Uh, but what it has, it has uh, EMG, EEG uh, gaze. Basically, we take physiological sensing from the head of the person. Uh, and we have a number of cameras, uh, like a thermal camera, like a camera on your back, uh, like a wide angle camera. And basically, we have a display. And what you can do in the end, you can zoom in. So one of the scenarios is, uh, let's say somebody is having something written over there. I would look over there, focus. Uh, it would zoom in. I could read uh, what you have on your uh, lab. Uh, once I read it, it would zoom out. And this would, without like I'm not deliberately having a button press zooming, it would be I look there, I concentrate, it would zoom in. And the question for us is this, does this become natural once we have this? How would this really change our perception? And we built one system uh, which is looking at uh, time perception. So what we do is, basically the ta task is very simple. Uh, you have a person who is jumping, and you have to guess how high that person is jumping. Very simple. And typically, people are not really good at this task because they can't look quick enough. Now what we do is, basically, you look, and if there is motion, we slow it down, and if motion is gone, we basically go back to, to normal speed. And it's really built like with a HoloLens and a camera and some stuff, uh, and so basically, we do that. And obviously, people can guess much precisely because they know how high the person has jumped. And now, this is sort of one of those things. You get used to something like this. And you could imagine, at the moment, it's still a bulky thing, but you could imagine with advances in contact lenses, with advances in glasses, that we get these things, that it, it becomes normal. Let's say there is a sign 200 meters away. You look at it. It zooms in. You read it. It zooms out. And you will probably, that's my, at the moment, it's, it's still, we cannot prove that. We assume if you have used this for a few weeks, this will be very normal. This will be just, if you have glasses and you take them on, you don't really think about having glasses. It's just there, it just works. And here I have another example showing what we really looked into is basically, this is sort of one of the examples. There is a bird, the bird is flying off, it's very quick, you don't see it. And what we have here is with the system, there's a bird, there is motion. Now basically while the motion happens, uh, we basically go down to one-tenth of the speed uh, while this happens. So you see it in slow motion. Once it's gone, you go back. And that's the tricky part. So you have to get basically your visual reality back 
somehow in sync with your physical reality is especially tricky if you walk. Uh, so I think you shouldn't walk with this. But I think for us, this is something where we really try to get into this, what happens if we can meddle with people's perception? And this is not like 10 years, 20 years out. I think we can see certain of those things being built in the next years. So one further, I have now three more points. Uh, I'm not going into detail here more. Betsy, this was sort of the, the, the two research uh, projects I wanted to focus on. I have a few more. And if you're interested, there are papers around it. So one area is creating new and convincing realities. This is something where I think at the moment we move from interaction design to designing new realities like uh, for people. And this is very much in the augmented reality space where I think we will see that in the real world much quicker. The virtual reality, I'm always a bit torn whether this is going to happen or not or how quickly this is going to happen. Because I think with all the advances, uh, I think I'm not sure, has somebody of you spent more than six hours in a row in VR? Would like to talk to people. More than four hours? More than two hours? OK, so we should talk later. <laughs> so uh, basically, we, we have this. Usually, people do two to three hours, and then they are sort of uh, done. And I think this makes it really hard. With augmented reality, I can really see that this is going, going much quicker. So this is a, another area, I think, where we see, and I think, once you have augmented reality, you have what I had on the previous slide. So there are things, so my walking down the street may be different from you walking down the street. And the thing what we had at a newspaper at the beginning that we see different news stories is then translated into the world. So you may see different things in the world than I do. And this is usually associated with being crazy. So, so from a very fundamental thing, if, if, basically if we walk down the street and you see other things than myself, this is really sort of tricking us as humans, because evolution is slow, into a difficult situation. And we see this already now with social media, the problems that arise. And they will be amplified massively once this happens in the real world. There is one further area that sort of makes this even more pleasant. That's why we will like it. So we looked into basically how can we do more intimate control that you, as I said, I concentrate on something. It focuses in, it goes out. I don't have to do things. And this is very much about physiological sensing on the body so that you really don't have to uh, think about how to control things. The right thing happens. And this is an interesting thing. I come later to this. The right thing happens means Somebody has decided the right thing. And for you, it's the right thing as long as it feels right. But there are always several options what you can do. And so somebody makes this decision uh, for you. And the final one here in this sort of uh, challenges is uh, security. And I think at the moment, everybody around Europe is uh, sort of AI, machine learning, uh, everybody, new professorships, new chairs. I think the next wave we're going to see is in that space. Because once all your stuff is online, all your stuff, basically, your, your reality depends on the digital. If it's not safe, you have a real problem in the real reality. Not like at the moment. At the moment, your bank account may be hacked, which is already quite some reality. Uh, or your emails may be stolen. But once it's basically your car, your home, uh, your medical devices, your medication, etc. This becomes uh, sort of much more fundamental. So I think this is for us one thing which we cannot really separate from that. That's why we look into, we call it human-centered uh, safety and security, uh, not just usable security. It's really, and I think just to give you a notion what we think about it, if you think of the place you live, that's probably pretty unsafe. So if somebody comes with us, so I live in the uh, countryside uh, half the time. I live in a house that has big windows, which is nice because we like to watch out. But we have also stones in the garden. So basically, technically breaking into our house is really easy. But why does it not happen all the time? There is law, there is law enforcement, there are neighbors, there are all these things. 
And I think when we look nowadays into computer security, it's the equivalent to building a bunker where it's not nice to live in. So basically, you try to make it safe, technologically safe. And imagine you have to get the place you live now safe if there would be no law enforcement, if there would be no laws, if there would be no neighbors. This would be a nightmare place to live. And I think that's why we argue with basic security. We have to see it on a societal level. It's not something we can technically build. Otherwise, we have this. I want to pay something on the bank. Then I have to take my phone. I get a card. I stick it somewhere in. I get another code, which I copy over. and. I, we know it, and I think this is basically, that's the equivalent to living in a bunker. And so that's why I think that topic is really, at the moment, massively underestimated. Uh, so, now let's go to this question. Uh, are we making choices or are we manipulated? And I think uh, what I put now with these research examples, this is not just about your search engine. This is really about everything in your life. So. This is a shop probably 100 years ago somewhere in the US. I found that picture on Wikipedia. And this is probably the last time you could say, show me all the shirts you have. I tried them out. And probably that guy would have been not happy, but he would have shown you this 20 shirts you have in your size. Now, if I go on AliExpress, I get 200,000. And obviously, some of them are not so nice, but uh, some of them uh, well, so basically, there's just no way I'm going to, through, to look at 200,000 shirts. And this is basically this massive dilemma. We have so many things. And this is whether we shop, whether we look in social media, whether we look into news, whether we look into friends we could make, whether we look into something like Tinder. The selection is so big, you cannot look at all the options. So what do you have to do? You have to have an algorithm that pre-sorts it. And this is sort of inevitable. So I think, and if you look at a moment uh, into some of the Euros European legislation on do not manipulate on the AI Act, they have not understood this. There is no way of not doing this. If you have 200,000 shirts, you will be using an algorithm to sort them. Because you cannot show somebody 200,000 shirts. Because we have this dilemma. You cannot consider all options. It will be taking longer than your life. Even for things like getting food in Munich over lunch, if you look sort of, uh, typically you make hierarchical choices. You say, oh, let's check the Indian restaurant. And then there, and even you don't read their whole menu. You read basically what they have at the top. So basically, there are choices made for you by presentation. So I think this is sort of a dilemma that's there and that's not being sort of, there is no solution from a theoretical perspective. You have to have an algorithm that does something. And so what we do nowadays, we call it very often keeping the human in the loop. And this is what we see here. Let's assume we have a million options. Then we use an algorithm, and nowadays it's very often machine learning AI. We pick 100, and we present them to the user classically in an ordered list. And then the user picks one and uh, has sort of the happy face, because she thinks, oh, I picked the right one. And I'll show you this with Paris. Paris has about 4 billion entries. How likely is it that you get the right thing on the first page? And then what Google does, they also give you basically sort of things you should look for. And we know from our research, you're very unlikely to scroll beyond place 50. You're very likely to be within 1 to 10, basically. Uh, and uh, you're very likely to use one of the suggestions, even so you wanted to look for something else. So now the question is, basically, are you in control? Or does it just feel right? Am I in control? And I think, just look at this one. And I think, basically, for the Paris example, we have here 4 billion. And here, typically, an ordered list of 
20, and then basically I pick one. So we are fooling ourselves into sort of believing we make a choice. We have a choice. And the real choice happens here. And we know who, uh, if we take the Google example, it's Google who has this choice. Assume you're looking on Amazon. How do they narrow this one down? If you go and take a course on uh, e-business, it's very simple how you narrow it down. This here is an optimization function. And you optimize for what will go with that user and what will make me the most profit. So this is it's typically very simple. Though these algorithms are not simple, but the goals of these algorithms are very simple. And you can try it yourself, basically search for something on Amazon, and uh, it only works on the web interface, interestingly, and you can basically then say a maximum price. And then it basically completely changes. Take something like a USB-C cable, very generic, and typically uh, in, on the German Amazon, it will show you USB cables for seven, eight, nine euros. Uh, and then if you say, uh, give me USB cable, C uh, cable be below six euros, you get a similar selection just from other. So basically it is something, what happens here is a lot of, that, that's really where the power sits. Now, is this new manipulation versus intelligent assistant? Imagine you go into a shop and you want to buy a guitar. And this is really something, this is not new. If you have studied marketing, uh, that's basically what they teach you. Basically, what do you do? You present the user with four items. One that's clearly out of their budget, which tells them that's basically the 250 euro wine bottle uh, on the menu, telling you whether it's 30 or 35 or 40, doesn't really matter. There's also one for 250. So basically, there's one that's out of your budget to, up, to basically make it. Then there is basically one that has low ratings uh, in the online world. Then there is one that's not available till next week, and then there's the one you want to sell. And typically, uh, we don't put this on place one. We put it now on place two or three, because people have learned what's on place one is usually. Uh, and so basically, if we do that, we get something like 50% who will click on that one. Again, sort of, this is not new. But this not only happens nowadays for shops, that happens for social media, that happens for news items, that happens if you basically look for partners, etc. And so basically, you have the feeling you make a choice, but you don't really. So the question is, again, sort of coming also back to the European AI Act, is this manipulation? When does manipulation start? If you have basically now 100 guitars and you have five minutes to show to the user 10 of them, which ones do you show? Are you free as a salesperson to choose what you show? And I think one interesting thing is random doesn't work anymore. Because if you have one million shirts and you pick 10 by random, they will be all ugly. So this is the problem. So random doesn't work. So, and I think this is again out of the user interface class. We know, for example, we have this, uh, basically, we have looked what trains to take, and then I could tell the user, take the train at 12.17 from platform six. I figured it out, it's the right thing you want to take. Users say, I don't want to tell by the system what to do. So what we usually do is basically we build something along these lines. Oh, there are two trains uh, or two options. Which one do you take? There's a train at 12.17, takes 45 minutes, or the bus takes 50 minutes, it's unreliable. <clears throat> we get the same result, but people feel much better with this one. And that's basically, again, classic interface design for something like this. Now, moving this a bit beyond sort of buying a shirt on Amazon to the dystopian vision. So, which route do I try from the airport in Munich, which is out here, to our office? So, recommendation, if you're in Munich, take the S-Bahn, it's faster. But if you drive and it's normal traffic, it will always take between 45 and 55 minutes. And there are more than 100 routes. And you see this basically, if you are a computer scientist, there are a lot of parallel routes. 
uh, with each parallel route, you double the number of options because you can come back. So basically, they all are the same uh, same time. And, and inner here, you have uh, plenty of. So so basically, which route do you take? Perhaps some of you have been uh, reading computer science or teaching computer science. Which is the right route? How does Google pick the route? Who studied computer science? <laughs> How does Google pick the route? Okay, so we have an optimization algorithm. And we get typically weights for basically we have different routes, we have average times. And so basically it optimizes it. And if you do this for Munich, uh, for example with OpenStreetMap, you get 100 routes which are basically in the order of three minutes difference which we know doesn't really make a difference in Munich because it's basically one lorry uh, parking backwards, uh, one traffic light, uh, so on that. So but there are 100 options. And obviously, Google is not evil. That was basically their motto over a long time. So that was their ethics statement, I think, till 2016, don't be evil. Basically, Google picks really the shortest one. But that is, in reality, it's one of the 100 shortest. So should we not rather auction them out like the space on your web pages. Should we basically say, uh, there's a person with that profile who drives now this route. Who pays for this route and who pays? Should I go past Aldi or past Starbucks? And I think I do this sometimes with students. We spend half an hour creating interesting algorithms and uh, each time at the end I feel I should start a company. Because there are so many great ideas, and they are sort of not more evil than what we have nowadays. Now let's take the next one. I think with food, I said already. I think uh, eating in Munich or any other place, I think you have so many options, uh, and you get recommendations. So now imagine I start recommending certain people certain places. I can segregate society. And this may be not even on purpose. It may be just because I have chosen a stupid machine learning algorithm that learns sort of, let's say, the white tall people uh, like this one and the red small people like this one. And it just may happen because the algorithm gets a better basis. Let's say the algorithm shows something and you pick it. And uh, that's basically the function on what the algorithm optimizes. So the algorithm may learn something which is really not desirable. It may segregate uh, society with food. And I think we can take it even one step further. That's my younger self, and it was in a time when you chose yourself, sort of, uh, whom to marry, which I think was a good choice. Uh, we're still together, so it was uh, not so bad. So. Uh, and I think nowadays, if you take something like Tinder, uh, and we had in our community a very remarkable keynote uh, in 2018, I guess, uh, which was basically the person uh, from OKCupid talked. And I think after that, I read more on it. And basically, there are companies out there that at the moment create half the matches of people, and there is no oversight. Half of the people who are now young will meet people over uh, online. And there's no oversight. So imagine somebody has really, is an evil genius. And again, this is again doing it with student uh, real fun. So if you have control over the Tinder algorithm, what bad things can you do? That's how we teach ethics. We have also written a short paper about this. This is because usually computer science students hate being taught ethics, but we usually teach us with big, these black scenarios. And the Tinder algorithm is something you get students really sort of half an hour completely crazy. And then you have these things, oh yeah, let's breed small people. That's sort of typically the, four, the first one. Uh, and, and I think you can then see, and the thing is, we very often think, oh, somebody is on controlling that. But what we have is basically the machine learning may basically assume the machine learning just says, okay, if people exchange more than 10 messages, this was a good match. Or if people meet, that was a good match. Whatever you put up. And this algorithm may basically get sort of, uh, may sort of figure out, oh, uh, the socioeconomic, basically people's uh, degree is sort of a key thing. I only match people uh, with university degrees and uh, people who have not finished school in their groups. 
that may basically create something which the algorithm gets a better result on. But this would be sort of uh, fundamentally criti critical for the society. And I think these things, there, there's no oversight. So again, this is sort of this dystopian uh, question. And so if we look at this, uh, basically where you go next, what you will order, what will, will match, basically how can we predict this? And I think this is sort of like the old saying, the best way to predict the future is to create it or at least nudge people into sort of the right way. And the navigation system, Tinder, basically the place where you uh, look for housing, those are all things. They make life choices for you. This order which you're shown flats, the order you're shown people, that really impacts. And it's really, obviously you make a choice in Tinder. You look at 300, probably, but you look now not at the 3 million that you could look at. And somebody makes this pre-selection. And at the moment, I think most of those companies are not evil making this pre-selection. They are really sort of trying to optimize their business. But uh, I think the question is really who should have the control over this. And I think this, we have written a short paper on the end of randomness, the end of serendipity, is basically uh, these things. And oops, sorry. Uh, Basically, it starts with what movie you watch, uh, the people you sit next to on the plane, uh, the people which way you walk to work, uh, which flat to buy, whom to marry. I think the question is, who do you trust with this decision? And this is, again, something technology has always done. So if you put a path somewhere, people will walk that path. But it's now... Basically, we can now individualize the path. And this is really, that's the new thing with the digital technology. And that's changing fundamentally what we do. Basically, we have this amplified and more hidden with digital technologies. The path, it's obvious, and I can choose not to take the path. Very often in the digital world, there's just not clear that I'm taking the path. It's just there, and it meddles with my mind. But I think what's important to know, you cannot not manipulate people's actions. So if I have a navigation system, I have to send them one way. If I have an online shopping system, I have to order it in one way or the other. And I think this is something, it's a fundamental dilemma we have as a trade, like the human-computer interaction people. And uh, there, I think, like a lot of the work you showed earlier, I think with the search where you really go refining that you basically, I think we may not get to look at a million things, but uh, we may also not be restricted to look at 10. I think by clever user interface techniques, we saw it with the hat, for example, <laughs> so we can go back and probably cover 100,000, so we can cover, basically, we can make more of these choices, and I think that's something that's really, really important research. And algorithms change real lives. So basically where you thrive, whom you marry, this is really changing people's lives. It's not like, oh, this is a drop box, down box where we sort things. It, it is really changing people's lives. And I think our uh, profession has not really learned that yet, that it's really changing uh, what, what people do. And I think uh, usually I argue sort of don't autoplay your life and don't build system that allow people to autoplay your life. And I think most of you probably have tried this. You are in front of Netflix, and just the next thing happens, or in front of YouTube, and it basically autoplays. And it's, it, it feels right very often, but it is fundamentally wrong, especially if you do it for your, uh, for your life. And now, once we have built this, it becomes worse. It's basically uh, this quote which is assigned to Winston Churchill, we shape our building and thereafter they shape us. And I think that has been discussed in architecture a lot and it's very well known. And I argue we shape our intelligent infrastructures and thereafter they shape us. And I think the question is really who is the we? And I have a concrete example. This, this sounds pretty abstract, right? This is sort of, ah, oh, we shape the infrastructure. How does it shape us? I give you one which you probably have suffered the last two years of. <clears throat> and this is a very simple one. One person has figured out, basically, 
imagine you were at Zoom at the time programming this bit. If you would have decided things start at five past and the slots are 10 minutes and you cannot schedule something between five past and five before, our life would have been much, much better. And I think after a year, Microsoft put some of that stuff into Teams. But this is what I mean. If we put it in the infrastructure, I think probably till now you haven't thought much about this dialogue. And, and I think obviously the HCI researchers have. I think, but it's, this was one of those things. This is something with just a very simple dialogue, you basically change people's lives. And this is why the power of putting stuff in the infrastructure is so big, especially if it makes impact on your, on your real life. So once it's in the infrastructure, you typically cannot opt out. And I think if, if you look at the Zoom interface, obviously you could go to the five minutes past. You can basically handcraft this. But this is, again, <coughs> this, this, that we usually don't do that. We are not doing this. Uh, we, we basically uh, go, go on that. And so how can we stay in control? And uh, we have a few years back written a short paper on intervention user interfaces. So the idea is that you create interfaces that make it really easy for people to intervene. So imagine you have an automated car. What interventions can you do? Can you tell the car to go faster, slower, to go into another direction, to take a different route? What of those interfaces do you want? And so I think there is sort of this whole set of automated systems, and we get really used to them. I think if you have a vacuum cleaner, an automated vacuum cleaner, a lot of automated things, and we just uh, let them do. We, we usually don't want to intervene. And one of those things is because we don't know how to intervene with them. And uh, I'm not going into detail. It's, it's in the paper if you're interested. So a lot of people have sort of worries when it works. Uh, they don't touch it. So uh, for example, heating systems. We have talked to a company that does heating systems. And they say they have basically you can, for example, when you go on holiday, you can switch your heating, uh, your central heating system to a holiday mode. People don't do that because they are worried to not be able to uh, get back. So I think we talked to them, and they have said about half of the systems come back uh, with the initial settings. People are not changing them. So they added something which they call a party button, which basically in Germany you have just that typically at 11 o'clock the heating goes down and comes back in the morning. And if you press this button, you get another hour of heat. That's used because people understand the intervention. And they understand after the invention, intervention, it goes back to regular use. So they obviously could also say, oh, for this week, I'm, I'm, doing, I, I'm on holiday. I'm going later. Uh, I'm getting up later, so I don't need to get the heating up at 6.30. I get it up at people don't do that. And this is basically this model. You have this automated behavior. And people say, I'm not touching it. I'm never sure. And I think if we get into this mode, imagine with the, the autonomous car. Oh, it, it, it drives me fine to work. Even so, I would like to see the sun, sunset or the, 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 the sunrise. I'm not doing that because I think it's just sort of, uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to risk that it doesn't do. And that's something where we looked a little bit into uh, and also put some uh, interface design principles up. And one of them, I just want to so, uh, go into this, basically communicate the options for interventions. So. Uh, I live during the weekend in a village where the train stops only if you press a button. This is uncommon. I think for buses, we know that. But for trains, this stops that only happen when you press the button. That's uncommon. So typically, we pick up our friends in the next city where it stops. <laughs> it's only a four kilometers drive, so it's not so bad. But it's, it's usually uh, so people just don't think of pressing the button because they are not uh, knowledgeable about the interventions that are possible, and it's not well designed. And I think this is one of those things. If you create an interface that's automated, you have to make sure 
to show to people where they can make interventions. Otherwise, it's basically you get them in this, in this autoplay mode, uh, which I find very critical. So to sum it up, I think we started out with the question, what is your reality? And it's really the perception and the interaction shapes your reality. And I think this interaction and perception of the world, 10,000 years ago, that was basically natural. But in the last 20 years, we have massively changed this. And the next 20 years, we're even more massively changing the interaction. So your reality becomes computer-mediated reality. And it already is. There are certain things you can do or certain things you cannot do. So basically, getting a certain train ticket, if it's not on offer, I think we had this sometimes. You know there are spaces on the, on the train. So I had this here. I bought my train ticket uh, with SNCF. Uh, because I usually buy it on sort of the German rail portal because I get a discount and they just didn't show me that train. And so I had to buy it on the other platform. So it was not a big difference, but it was very clear. There is a, but I cannot do it. So basically it's, it's changing my reality. Like really, so this interaction perception. And the critical thing is we will not share interaction and perception. I think traditionally our brain is wired. If we are in the same place, we see the same things. And if one of us is seeing something else, there is something wrong. And I think we are now on the screen space. We have already moved to this that everybody gets their own. And we are now in this place moving that also in the world we get sort of different views. And this may be the biggest challenge for society. I think we see this sort of already with social media that people are having different experiences. And I think once this happens in the real world, and that's why I think from a research perspective, human-computer interaction is really shaping interactions in the future world. And, and basically, we are shaping the reality of the future. And this puts a lot of pressure on basically when we teach. And that's why I said a few times how we teach, for example, the ethics stuff. And I think. Uh, teaching ethics by, by giving people philosophical texts to read, uh, at least with German engineering students, that doesn't really work. But with uh, making them design a new Tinder version that's evil, and then reflecting an hour on it, that has, has been, been working quite well. And I think uh, with this, I'm at the end. I have a few acknowledgments. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that the European Union is around. Uh, and they fund some of my research, and also that uh, in Germany, the ministry. For. And uh, with this, I think um, I stop, and uh, oops. And uh, I'm not sure if you have time for questions here. Yes, okay. okay.